Just wait a few minutes for some people to get on. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for joining us for this endocrinology tutorial. So today's tutorial is on a clinical approach to the thyroid and adrenal glands, and it's given by Jay. So we've just got a few rules. If you're watching via Zoom, any questions or comments for things that are covered in the moment or relevant to the discussion, if you can just pop it into the chat. Any questions that can wait to the end or any general questions, just pop it into the Q&A. If you're watching on the Facebook Live, just comment your questions and comments and we'll just pass them on to the tutor and get it answered. And yeah, that's all from me and I'll pass it over to Jay now. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, hi, my name's Jay and I've just recently graduated from Brighton Sussex Medical School. And I'm going to talk you through endocrinology today, mainly the thyroid and adrenal glands. So what we're going to cover is we're going to recap kind of how the anterior pituitary physiology kind of works. Then we're going to move on to talk about the thyroid being that hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism and a little bit about malignancy. And then we're going to learn about kind of the pathology of the adrenal glands being too much adrenal hormone or too little. So when you think about endo, the easiest way is to go back to kind of what you've learned in your preclinical years. And as you can see here on the right, we have a diagram. So what happens is the hypothalamus releases releasing hormones, which act on the anterior pituitary to create, uh, to cause it to release stimulating hormones, which then have a direct effect on the gland to secrete its own hormone. That hormone goes ahead and has, goes ahead and makes its desired effect around the body. Um, and then it also goes back to the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary providing negative feedback to stop the process from getting exponentially large and kind of make a homeostasis type mechanism. So again, hypothalamus is releasing hormones and anterior pituitary is stimulating hormones. Um, and when we talk about pathology in endocrinology, we typically say that primary pathology is that of the gland and secondary pathology is that of the pituitary or the hypothalamus. So this is a bit of a busy slide, so I do apologise, but on the left here is the final organ um, that you're kind of thinking about. Um, and then at the top, you have the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary and the gland itself. So these are the hormones that it releases. We're going to talk through the adrenal glands and the thyroid today, but the anterior pituitary also produces um, GnRH, which affects sex organs. Um, but that's kind of the remit of the gynecological doctors in women. And then also growth hormone, which I'm not really going to touch on today, but it's good to remember what, what the anterior pituitary does do. Um, and it also releases prolactin and melanocyte stimulating hormone. And I'm not going to talk about those because they have a slightly different mechanism of working, but it's good to recap them because they can come up in clinical examinations sometimes. Um, and then the posterior pituitary works in a slightly different way, but it produces oxytocin, which is really helpful for obstetric doctors and antidiuretic hormone, which is kind of the arena of fluid balance and salt balance. So we're gonna talk about the thyroid now. So it sits in the neck, um, just below the thyroid cartilage. That's kind of one of your landmarks when you're palpating for it. Um, it's split into two lobes and it's um, in the middle part, it's joined by something called the isthmus. And then if you look at the posterior view, um, you have four parathyroid glands sitting um, on the back of it and they're about the size of a grain of rice and that's kind of the anatomy that I would expect you to know maybe the blood vessels as well if you want to look that up. So the axis itself the hypothalamus releases thyrotropin releasing hormone which acts on the anterior pituitary which makes it secrete thyroid stimulating hormone which then acts on the thyroid to make T3, T4 and T3 um, and then the T4 and T3 have that negative feedback effect to stop the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary releasing their hormones. So a bit about the thyroid hormones themselves. Um, T3 is much more active than T4, so it's five times more active approximately. Um, but the thyroid itself mainly produces T4 um, and you get your majority of your T3 from the peripheral conversion of that T4 that the thyroid is pumping out. Um, T3 and T4 are mostly bound to to protein. So um, in the body, you kind of have to assess a patient's um, protein status before you can kind of make a real estimate of how much free T4 that they're going to have floating around. 
And the overall effect that these hormones have is that they increase cell metabolism um, and they also increase catecho cat cat catecholamine effects, sorry. Um, and that's things like noradrenaline, adrenaline and dopamine. So on to a clinical case. Mrs. Mrs. T is a 43 year old female who for the past five months has noticed she has been incre feeling increasingly restless. She reports being constantly hungry but continues to lose weight and in total she's lost 13 kilograms. When you question her further, she says that she feels hot all of the time when everyone else is in coats. Um, she's had some episodes of diarrhea and she's only had two periods in the time despite being normally regular of a, a 28 day cycle. She also comments that she has a swelling in the neck and that her eyes look different. So I'll let everyone have a think about what they think it is. Um, but what we're talking about here really is hyperthyroidism. So when it comes to signs and symptoms, you kind of have to remember what the thyroid gland does itself and what the thyroid hormones do. So they increase metabolism and they increase um, the catecholamine effects. So the symptoms are going to mimic that. So in terms of metabolism, patients will have an increased appetite and they'll report weight loss generally. Um, they will have a reduction in their periods. And then for the catecholamine effects, they'll feel hyperactive. Um, they won't, they'll feel constantly hot. So they're kind of always the ones without the jacket, um, even in the middle of winter. They'll feel irritable and have labile emotions. Um, they'll have palpitations, so that kind of funny beating in the chest feeling and they will have a tremor. Obviously not everyone presents with everything, but these are the kind of general symptoms for that. Um, in terms of signs, they might have a goiter, which I'll explain what that is in a minute. Um, they'll have a fine tremor, and the way you test for that is you get the patient to put their arms out in front of them, and you can put a piece of paper on their hands and watch it kind of flicker. So that's a way of just um, examining for a fine tremor. They might have red palms, um, and they're gonna have a fast pulse from all that kind of adrenaline effects. Um, and that can be irregularly irregular, which is atrial fibrillation, which comes with its own risk of sort of thromboembolic events. So that's why it's really important we catch these patients um, before it's kind of something bad's happened. Uh, they may also have thyroid eye disease, but again, I'll explain a bit more about that later. And they might also have clubbing. So it's always good to have a handful of lists of why patients might have clubbed fingers. Um, and this is one of them. So what is a goiter? You can see on the picture here on the right, um, it's in the lady's neck and it's a midline symmetrical swelling that's due to the enlargement of the thyroid gland. Um, so if you're saying a goiter, you mean the thyroid. So in a neck examination, OSCE for example, do be careful that if you don't think it's the thyroid, you don't necessarily say goiter because they are one and the same. Um, so for every examination, we do inspection, palpation and auscultation, and this is no different. So we want to see what it looks like. Does it look red? Um, and then you also get a patient to have a glass of water with them and you get them to swallow. And the thyroid gland will move up on swallowing. Um, there is something different you can do where you protrude, ask the patient to protrude their tongue. Uh, that's checking for something different. That's checking for something called a thyroglossal cyst, which is a differential of the midline um, neck lump, but that won't happen in the thyroid. So sometimes that's a bit confusing as to the difference there. When you palpate it, you want to check to see if it's diffuse, so big all over, or nodular, so bumpy. Um, again, you stand behind the patient and get them to take a sip of water and you'll feel that the gland itself moves up also. And then you want to percuss to see if it goes behind the sternum, so you just kind of percuss down the sternum. Um, and the reason that is, is because sometimes the patients are treated with surgery and it's much more difficult to treat a patient with a retrosternal goiter. So the surgeons like to know about it early on. And in terms of auscultation, when you pop your stethoscope on, you'll be able to hear a brewery, so that's kind of like a whooshing sound, and that's due to the increased vascularity of the gland. So when we think about the causes of a goiter, we split it into um, whether or not they're nodular or diffuse, so again, bumpy or smooth. Um, the nodular causes are a multinodular goiter, a adenoma, so a benign lump, or a carcinoma, a malignant lump. And other diffuse and diffuse causes are kind of the systemic thing. So the things that go wrong with all the body, such as Graves' disease, Hashimoto's thyroiditis and subacute thyroiditis. So when we think about the causes of hyperthyroid itself, not just the goiter, um, we think about, again, in terms of endocrinological terms, uh, primary is of the gland, so of the thyroid and secondary is of the pituitary or the hypothalamus. So for the primary reasons, the kind of main one to know about is Graves' disease. 
um, which I will go through in, a, in, a next, in the next slide, I think. Um, and the second is that toxic multinodular goiter, where the word toxic in thyroid disease just means that they're thyroid toxic, so they've got too much of their thyroid hormone. Um, and what that is, is different nodules on the thyroid aren't acting to that feedback that you're talking about, so they act independently of the feedback systems. Um, a toxic adenoma is similar, but it's just one nodule. Um, De Quervain's thyroiditis is a post-viral self-limiting tender goiter that has a hyperthyroid phase followed by a hypothyroid phase. Slightly more niche, but um, if, you, if you want to have a look at that, you can look into it in a bit more detail. And then there's also exogenous causes. So the thyroid hormones are made from iodine. Um, so if you have too much iodine in your diet or from other sources, um, then that can lead to an increase in the thyroid hormones. Um, some drugs we give can also cause this to be a problem. So amiodarone and lithium are the two that you think of, but they do co confusingly more commonly cause hypothyroidism, but they are able to cause hyperthyroidism too. And in a patient that has a problem with their thyroid already, contrast media can make this much worse. Um, and in terms of second, so that's of the gland, the problems that can happen to the gland. Uh, the problems that can happen to the pituitary are a thyroid stimulating hormone producing pituitary adenoma, um, and that's incredibly rare. So you're probably more looking towards these sort of things when you're thinking of differential for hyperthyroidism. So what is Graves' disease? It's an autoimmune condition that affects mainly women, um, but obviously can affect men as well. Um, it's associated with um, vitiligo, type 1 diabetes mellitus and Addison's disease, so all, they're all autoimmune conditions. Um, it's always a really important differential in someone that's already suffered from some sort of autoimmune condition to think about other autoimmune conditions when they present to either the GP or hospital. Um, and so what it is, is it's thyroid stimulated hormone receptor antibodies that bind to the TSH receptors and then cause the thyroid hormone to release excess, thy the thyroid to release excess th thyroid hormone, sorry. So if we have a look at the picture on the right, um, the left-hand side is what normally happens. So the pituitary gland releases that TSH, it binds to the TSH receptor, makes the hormone happen, and then once the hormone's made, so T4, will go back and stop the pituitary gland from making more. In Graves' disease, patients' immune systems have made this antibody, which constituently binds to the TSH receptor, so it doesn't come off and then you get increased hormone production, and that's not regulated by this negative feedback because it has nothing to do, the fact that that's binding has nothing to do with the um, kind of pituitary system. So what would we expect to see in these patients? They would have a smooth thyroid enlargement. Um, they might also have thyroid eye disease. So a goiter and thyroid eye disease are synonymous with Graves. So if you see a patient with those, that is Graves' disease. Um, and they may also have something called pretibial myxedema, which is where they get to put deposition in their anterior lower leg, and it kind of leads to like bumpy bits of the anterior of their leg. So thyroid eye disease, I've got some pictures on the right so you can see. So like I said before, this is in Graves' disease, um, and it's to do with those antibodies. So the patients might have exophthalmus, which is also known as proptosis, um, and that's this lady on the top here who has her eyes bulging out of the socket. Um, in terms of when you're doing a thyroid status exam, it's really important that you examine from the, like, not just from front on, but also from the side and from above to be able to make sure you don't miss that. Um, these patients, because their eyes are kind of out of their head a bit more than they should be, are at risk of things like corneal ulceration. Um, so that's a problem for the ophthalmologist, this kind of joint care. Um, and because they've got hypertrophy of their extraocular muscles, which you can see in this MRI scan here, these shouldn't be this big. Um, this is not the worst that you can kind of pitch and get, but these shouldn't be this big. That puts pressure on the eyes um, and can lead to papilledema and optic nerve compression, so it can jeopardise these patients' sight. So it is a serious thing to worry about. They might also have ophthalmoplegia, which is kind of altered inability to do certain eye gazes and in thyroid eye disease, typically upward gaze is the one affected. Um, and patients may also have lid lag, which because their eyes are poking out, it's more difficult for them to shut their eyes. So when we're investigating these patients, we need to check their thyroid function tests. So what we do is we check for the TSH. Um, this changes throughout the day, so it's important to monitor at the same time. It's kind of lowest at night time, peaks around 2 p.m. 
um, and you also check for the T4 and T3, so the thyroid hormones. And in terms of interpreting results, it's really useful to come back to our um, axis here. So primary, like I said before, it's of the gland, so it's of the thyroid, it's gonna be affecting here. Um, so what's gonna happen is you're gonna have the thyroid just acting upon its own, so it's just gonna be making these hormones. Um, and then the negative feedback is gonna come into play, so you're gonna have a low TSH. So you're gonna have a high T4 and low TSH. Um, if the T3 is measured, it can sometimes be low, but come, uh, it's, it's rarer that it's high. And in terms of secondary, this is where there's a problem with the anterior pituitary. It's making too much TSH, which is then stimulating the thyroid gland to make too much hormone. Um, so you've got um, an increase in the TSH and in the T4. And then some other investigations you might want to do to kind of think about why is this patient hyperthyroid? Because it's not, hyperthyroidism is not a diagnosis in itself. It's kind of a, a syndrome that's happening for a different reason. So you need to pinpoint that reason. Um, and you want to do some imaging on these patients. So you do an ultrasound scan of the neck. Um, you want to see if any lumps that exist there are cystic, because that means they're more likely to be benign, or to see if they're solid, and that's more likely to mean that they're malignant. But any kind of solitary nodule on its own needs to be fine needle aspirated and sent to the histopathologist to check for any signs of malignant cells. And then thyroid gland, uh, the thyroid has a special type of scan called an isotope scan, which helps you look for the differential as well. So this is the isotope uptake scans and the ones that are commonly used on the thyroid are technetium 99 and iodine 123. Um, and again, this is to determine the cause of the hyperthyroidism. And it also lets you know whether or not um, the patient's got that retrosternal retro goiter that we talked about. And also, if it is malignancy, it shows whether or not there's any metastasis of this malignancy. So there's a picture on the right here of, of some different types of scans. Um, and when you talk about the scans themselves, you talk about the nodule as either hot or cold. So hot means more, so this is the normal thyroid gland, kind of this mixed gray. Um, if it's a hot nodule like this, it means that there's more uptake of the um, media. So you get a darker, um, like a darker patch um, and that can either be for one singular toxic adenoma or for toxic multinodular goiter. If it's a cold nodule that's where there's less uptake so this one here um, and that kind of indicates there's more chance of it being malignant. 20% um, of people with a cold nodule will have a malignancy or you can have kind of a diffuse increase in uptake such as in Graves disease. Another thing you want to look for, like I said, this is an autoimmune condition, so you want to check to see if the body's making any antibodies. And there's, um, there's some antibodies that are kind of uh, non-specific for just general autoimmunity, be that for causes of hyper or hypothyroidism. And those are the anti-thyroid peroxidase antibodies, also known as anti-TPO antibodies, or the anti-thyroglobulin antibodies. Um, and then there's a type of, uh, as we talked about before, there's a type of antibody that's specific to Graves' disease. So if you're wanting to diagnose someone with Graves' disease, you definitely want to check that they've got a TSH receptor antibody. So on to treatment, what I'll do is at the end of hyperthyroidism, I'll ask any, answer any questions as best as I can. Um, so the treatment, there's quite a lot of different treatments for this. Uh, and the first slide we're going to talk through is the medical ones. So the first line drug you're going to give is carbimazole. Um, and it works kind of within one to two months, and then the patient will continue uh, maintenance therapy. And there's two ways of doing this. So you can kind of go slowly and make it to the right level for that patient. So you kind of suppress their, um, suppress their hormone um, to their correct level, and that's called titration block. Or there's block and replace. And what you do there is you completely kind of wipe out the thyroid gland by giving a high dose of carbimazole. Um, and you just replace it with thyroxine, which is thyroid hormone, um, and there's pros and cons to each. Um, patients will stop treatment after 12 to 18 months and half will be fine, and that's kind of it, and then half will relapse and have to go on to have further management. And in terms of your pharmacological questions or your PSA questions, um, carbimazole has a major side effect of agranulocytosis, so um, a lack of neutrophils, and that puts patients really at risk of getting kind of really nasty infections. So if these patients present with a sore throat or a high temperature, um, they might need to come into hospital, or they will need to come into hospital for investigations. 
Um, the second line drug that you can use is propyl thiouracil, and that prevents that peripheral conversion of T4 into T3. Um, the reason this is less used than carbimazole is because it has um, some unfavorable hepatic reactions. Um, I'll just say also on carbimazole, it is teratogenic, so you need to make sure any people that are at risk of getting pregnant, um, so kind of like premenopausal women, are on effective contraception. And then you can also treat the patient's symptoms by giving them beta blockers, because we talked about how there's an increase in catecholamines um, when there's too much thyroid hormone, so you want to block their adrenergic system. Uh, and the best way to do this is through non-selective beta blockers, such as propanolol. Then if, so like I said, 12 to 18 months, if that hasn't worked, the patients can go on to have radioactive iodine. So what they do is they take a drink with radioactive iodine in and the radiation basically get, the iodine gets into the thyroid cells and destroys them. Um, this often leads patients hypothyroid. So you then have to replace their thyroid hormone with the roxin anyway. Um, there's some contraindications. So if someone pregnant or is planning to get pregnant within the next six months, then they, this is not for them. Um, and also if they're breastfeeding. Uh, it can be a bit tricky as well because you have to be able to limit contact following procedure. So you have to, uh, for a few days, so you have to have a specialist kind of place that they can be in their own side room. Um, and then for the next three weeks, they need to be able to avoid contact with children or pregnant women. And sometimes that's difficult for individuals. So this is all about kind of a, a personalized patient's approach as to what they would like. And then the definitive management of hyperthyroidism is um, thyroid surgery, so thyroidectomy. Um, the reasons you might want to do this for a patient is because they might have failed their treatment, like I said before. Um, if they've got a goiter, they may feel self-conscious and want to, um, you know, kind of get rid of it because they don't feel very confident with one. Um, if they've got cancer, the gland needs to come out. Um, and if they've got compression symptoms, so because of where it sits in the neck, um, anterior to the trachea and then just behind the trachea is the esophagus, uh, you get um, potentially some life-threatening kind of um, a tracheal obstruction, uh, which is obviously an indication, and then also the patient might complain of dyspepsia or dyspepsia. And the gland can either be totally or partially removed. Um, in terms of complications, it's always a really good question for kind of surgical OSCEs is tell us the complications of this specific surgery. And two general ones that you can say are um, infection and bleeding. Uh, they tend to kind of count for most surgeries, even though they're not the most specific answer to any surgeries. But I'll go through the common ones for, well, they're not necessarily common, but the ones that come up a lot um, in terms of thyroid surgery. So when it comes to bleeding here, because of where it is in the neck, it's really highly vascular and there's also your trachea there. So patients can get a hematoma, hematoma forming, which might obstruct their airway within 24 hours. And this is a real A to E emergency. So patients with a Thyroidectomy will always have suture removers at the side of their bed um, just in case this happens because there won't be time to rush them to theatre if, if it does happen. Another one that is really good to know about is the patients might complain of a hoarse voice. Um, that's because in the neck, the, uh, the thyroid sits next to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is responsible for vocal cord movement. Um, and patient, uh, either the, you can either get kind of paralysis post surgery or um, if there's an accident and it's kind of cut, then that can cause them to have a hoarse voice, which is a common medical legal problem. Um, and then because the parathyroids sit behind the thyroid, if you take them out and they're only small, it's quite difficult to um, know that you haven't missed them altogether. Um, patients can get hypoparathyroidism, which leads to hypocalcemia. And again, some quite drastic urgencies there with that. Um, and then later down the line, the patients might become hypothyroid and need that replacement with thyroxine. Um, On to the last bit for hyper, hyperthyroidism. Um, this is kind of the severe form of hyperthyroidism that you worry about in the acute scenario. It's an emergency and it's called thyrotoxic storm or thyrotoxic crisis. Patients will present confused, agitated. They might have atrial fibrillation, tachycardia, diarrhea and vomiting. Um, heart failure and they'll be hyperthermic. Um, this kind of doesn't just happen because a patient with hyper, hyperthyroidism is walking down the street. Um, you need to have something to precipitate it. So that could be um, infection or trauma or most commonly post thyroid surgery or radioiodine treatment. So you need to look out for this as well as a complication. 
Um, the way you treat them is propanolol for those symptoms. Um, and if you can't get the heart rate under control, you might need to use tadoxin. Um, you also give them quite high dose steroids to prevent the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. Um, and you treat the underlying cause as always in medicine. So back to our case. Mrs. T is a 43 year old who for the past five months has noticed that she's been feeling increasingly restless. She reports being constantly hungry, but continues to lose weight. She feels hot all the time, has had diarrhea and only two light periods in this time. She has a swelling in her neck and she says that her eyes look bulging. So for this question, what it's asking is which investigation is most likely to provide you with your diagnosis? And the options are thyroid function tests, TSH receptor or antibody, serum thyroglobulin, ultrasound scan and isotope scan. So what I'll do is I'll release that poll now. Okay, so I'll just give it another couple of seconds. Okay, so I'm going to end that now. So most people have put, it's kind of a bit of a split. So the most likely to provide a diagnosis is TSH receptor antibody. And that's because this lady has Graves disease. Um, if you look at her presentation, she's got, she's thyrotoxic. So she's got hyperthyroidism. She's got a goiter because she's got a swelling in her neck and she's got thyroid eye disease because her eyes are bulging. So what you need to check for here is the TSH receptor antibody. Questions like this are a bit confusing, but they do come up often because they're single best answer, um, which means like there's more than one right answer, but you have to pick the most right one. So in terms of the diagnostic investigation for Graves' disease, um, TSH receptor antibody is the one. Thyroid function test will obviously give you a clue as to whether or not it's a primary pathology and tell you what's going on, but it's not necessarily going to give you that diagnosis you're after, like the question asks for. And um, an isotope scan, again, will show that diffuse uptake, but the diagnostic investigation for Graves' disease is TSH receptor antibodies. Ultrasound scan gives you an idea, but not the diagnosis, and serum thyrogobulin is a marker for a malignancy. Okay, so just see if there's any questions I can quickly answer. Um, so is T to toxic multinodular goiter a malignancy or just an overactive thyroid? Um, it's not a malignancy, it's just little nodules on the thyroid that are producing thyroid hormone um, independently of the TSH stimulation. So hopefully that answers your question. And then secondly, how is the pathology, has her physiology of parma erythema? Um, I'm not sure exactly of the pathophysiology, but um, it's one of those things that I always thought was just specific to liver disease, but can be caused in other things. Um, I'm sorry, I can't give you the exact pathophysiology, but hopefully that will let you know that there's more causes than just um, hepatic causes. Okay, so I'm going to move on now to our next case, who is Mrs. C. And she's a 35-year-old female that comes to the GP complaining of feeling tired for the past four months. She has also noticed that she's gained some weight and is feeling cold despite it being summer and she's got some constipation too. She's also complaining of low mood. So this sounds kind of exactly the opposite of our previous lady. So what we're going to talk about here is hypothyroidism. So in terms of signs and symptoms, you're kind of thinking the opposite of hyperthyroidism here. So I often like to remember them in couples because then I can remember one's high, one's low, and that's kind of makes you easier to remember. So symptoms are tiredness or lethargy, um, inability to handle the cold, so they'll constantly want jumpers on, um, even in summer. They might have a low mood and some constipation. Rather than light periods, they're going to have heavy periods, and they're going to feel weak and kind of muscle achy as well. If untreated, this can lead to heart disease and dementia, so it is quite severe. Um, I think because it's so common, sometimes people think, oh, you know, it's not the biggest deal in the world, but it, is, it needs to be treated. Um, in terms of signs uh, to look for on your thyroid status examination, you're looking for kind of slow relaxing reflexes is one of the hallmarks of um, hypothyroidism. They might have thin, dry hair or skin, and sometimes people are talking about losing the kind of outer third of the eyebrow. Um, they're gonna have a round face and have obesity because they've got decreased metabolism. Um, 
they're going to have they're going to be edematous and that's why the name uh, another name for hypothyroidism is myxedema you might see that written sometimes in textbooks um, not used so much anymore though i don't think um, and that can be in the feet eyelids and hands uh, they may have a goiter depending on the cause of their hypothyroidism and they're going to be cold peripherally so when we think about the causes again primary of the gland secondary of the pituitary or hypothalamus so when it comes to the um, primary causes so the problems directly with the thyroid we split them into autoimmune or other the autoimmune conditions are Hashimoto's thyroiditis and what happens here is the patients get a goiter because they get infiltration of tissue uh, of cells such as lymphocytic cells um, and they'll have those high anti-TPO and, and, and anti-thyroglobulin antibodies. The commonest cause is though the primary atrophic hypothyroidism and these patients won't have a goiter because what happens is the lymphocytes enter the thyroid um, and then they cause atrophy of the gland so you won't see a swelling there. In terms of other um, drug-induced so if you are blocking a patient's thyroid function with um, carbimazole, then they're gonna, they might be hypothyroid. Um, and again, amiodarone and lithium are more likely to cause hypothyroidism. Um, again, similarly, if you've treated them for hyperthyroid, you might make them hypothyroid. So after their surgery or radioiodine treatment. And then there's that subacute thyroiditis, also known as de Quervain's thyroiditis. Um, which is where they have that hyperthyroid phase after a viral infection that leads to temporary hypothyroidism. Um, in terms of secondary pituitary problem, a low TSH um, will lead to a low T4, but again, that's incredibly rare. So generally you're thinking about problems with the gland itself. Um, and it's important to note, work, note for kind of your global health aspect is that worldwide iodine deficiency is the number one cause of hypothyroidism. Um, but in the UK, we supplement food, so this doesn't necessarily happen here. Investigations. Again, you want to do your thyroid function tests. So you do your T4, and T3 is not necessarily as helpful here because um, T3 comes from T4. If there's not a lot of T4, there's not going to be a lot of T3. Um, uh, TSH, again, to check what the anterior pituitary is doing. And when it comes to primary disease, that's of the thyroid again going to not be making much of this so you're not going to have any negative feedback so you're going to be making a lot of this so you have high thyroid stimulating hormone low t4 and in secondary that's your pituitary tumor um, not making enough tsh they're going to have low tsh leading to low TS t4 other investigations you might want to do um, a common hematological question is what are the causes of um, kind of microcytic or macrocytic anemias um, hypothyroidism causes a macrocytic anemia um, so that's a good differential for kind of your b12s and folates deficiencies as well and these patients are at risk increased risk of cardiovascular mortality so they've got raised cholesterol and triglycerides also so how do we treat them quite simply they're missing thyroid hormone so you give them thyroid hormone which is called levothyroxine and what you want to do is you want to increase their t4 without suppressing their tsh but um Thyroxine, levothyroxine has got quite a long half-life, so you have to wait quite a long time, so four to six weeks before you check any changes that you've made to doses to see what the TSH is doing. Um, and when you're talking thinking about treating patients, you kind of categorize them into kind of fit and young or LV or patients with cardiac problems. Um, young and healthy, you can go a bit more gung-ho and then review them a bit later. Whereas patients with cardiac problems, you have to go low and slow and increase slowly as well. Um, because you can precipitate kind of an MI or angina. So this is a bit of a treatment, uh, this is a bit of a question now again. So Mrs. Th C has come back to us eight months later. We've done our treatment. We've done our TFT TFTs. We've put her on her thyroxine. She's coming back and she's complaining that her symptoms are still um, troubling her. So she comes in to get her TFTs monitors and below are her results. So she's got a high TSH and a high T4. So the question here is, what is the cause of this presentation? Um, normal finding, poor compliance to medication, Graves' disease, hypothyroidism, and sick thyroidism. Um, I'll just give you a second because before I've released the poll, because you've got to look at, again, high TSH and high T4, that's what you're thinking about here. Okay, so that poll should come up on the screen now. <clears throat> 
this is a little bit of a tricky one so if you don't feel like you can answer it, it's kind of one of those trick ones that lecturers often put up at the end to kind of catch you out i will explain why in a moment just give it a couple more seconds in case someone wants to answer that hasn't okay i'm going to stop it there so i think you can be able to see the results now um, most common answer just by fraction is poor compliance to medication and that is the right answer um, the reason that is is because what happens is patients oh sorry i just had a technological issue um, patients will not be taking their thyroxine and then all of a sudden they'll come in and they'll need a blood test so um, they'll take quite a lot of their thyroxine um, and because tsh takes kind of six weeks to normalize back down to a normal level um, they're going to have that high TSH. So this is a bit of a trick. It's a bit of a tricky question. Don't worry if you didn't get it right. Um, but this is kind of the classical presentation of a patient that hasn't been adhering to their medicine and then takes too much because they think the doctor's going to be able to find them out. Um, and I think that's maybe why that our lecturers think that is a good question to ask because it annoys them maybe. I don't know. Um, term, in terms of normal findings, um, no she's symptomatic therefore this is not normal and they would be within normal ranges if they were normal findings um graves disease you'd expect to have a low tsh because you've got that antibody there um and a high t4 so you get that the high tsh is not right for graves disease hypothyroidism kind of has it in the title whatever the cause you have to have a low t4 to to be hypothyroid this patient doesn't have that um so while she has hypothyroid implementation her blood results are slightly spurious um, because of the way she's been taking her medications um, and sick thyroidism which was the next common one um, is when a patient comes in who is um, kind of poorly themselves so it happens a lot in geriatric patients um, and their thyroid function gets knocked off but the hallmark of that is low everything so they have low TSH and low T4 so I hope that makes sense I'm gonna move I just check there's nothing else on this and then we'll move on Okay, so mixed edema coma um, is the kind of severe version of um, hypothyroidism. So it's a severe hypothyroid state that can lead to death if untreated. Um, and these are going to have the opposite kind of symptoms of the patients that come in with a thyrotoxic storm. So they're going to be hypothyroid um, in their kind of status exam. They're going to have a low temperature, a low glucose. Um, they could be psychotic or have um, kind of a pre-coma state. Um, they're going to have a low heart rate and they might have heart failure. Again, it doesn't tend to happen to a patient that's just walking down the street. Um, you have to have something precipitates it. So that might be pituitary surgery. Um, it might be radio iodine therapy or taking the thyroid out or a heart attack or trauma. So you have to make sure you correct the hypoglycemia. Replace their fluid, but cautiously because they, they have a problem with their heart. Um, you give them T3 until they're better and T4 afterwards. So the reason that patients get T4 rather than T3, you know, T3 is more active. Why don't we just give that in the first place? Um, the body is generally really good at converting T4 to T3, but it takes a bit of time. Thyro levothyroxine is cheap and works really well. Um, so in most patients, that's suitable. Um, but for patients that are acutely unwell like this, they need that active form of the hormone very quickly. Um, so they get the slightly more expensive T3. Um, you might want to give them antibiotics if you think an infection has precipitated it and um, they might need ventilation if they're not passing that fluid off their lungs. Okay, so I'm going to go on to thyroid malignancy and then I'll see if there's any questions I'll answer in the chat. So I'm going to really briefly quick over, um, rush over this because um, it, it's not the most like, kind of much to say. Um, but when I think about the different types of cancer, I split them into kind of the better cancers, so the better prognosis the medium prognosis and then the worst prognosis um, and the better ones are called differentiated so if someone says differentiated thyroid cancer they mean papillary carcinoma or follicular carcinoma they have quite a good survival and then the most common type of thyroid malignancy the kind of medium category is medullary carcinoma um, and t-cell lymphoma t-cell lymphoma is incredibly rare and sometimes called different things um, and then the worst is anaplastic, and that's got a 10% five year survival, so that's not great. So if you want to look a bit more about the details, then that's fine. But I just thought I'd whiz through those um, to give you an idea of the five types. Um, and then another good question for single best answers is name tumour markers. And in terms of the thyroid, um, medullary cells in the thyroid make calcitonin, 
which um, acts as the opposite of parathyroid hormone. So in a medullary carcinoma, you're going to have increases in calcitonin as your biomarker for malignancy. Um, and then in papillary and follicular, so the differentiated cancers, you're going to have an increase in thyroglobulin. Um, and then another, uh, so they metastasize to the lung and bone and often asked in um, like by face to face or on papers is which cancers metastasize to the bone. People often find it hard to think of. Um, so it's breast, thyroid, lung, kidney and prostate. So there's some ways that people try to remember it. So um, the one, one of the ones that springs to mind is breast, thyroid, bung, kidney and um, prostate. I don't know if that works for you, but some people find because it's so silly that it does. Um, other ones that you can use is the way I like to think about it. I've been taught by friends and things is that think of things that come in pairs. So the breasts come in pairs. Um, the thyroid has two lobes. The lung, there's two lungs, there's two kidneys and the prostate has kind of two lobes. So that might be able to help you think of other reasons. So before we move on to the adrenal glands, I'll just see if there's any more questions. Oh, sorry. They were, they're all about um, how old the patient was, but I can't remember which patient that was at that time, so I do apologise. Um, I'm going to move on to the adrenal glands now, so hopefully everyone's ready for that. So anatomy, they sit um, quite handily, as their name says, on top of the kidneys in these little blue bits here. So adrenal on top of the kidneys, um, that's kind of the anatomy, my level of anatomy. Um, so obviously you can learn more if you, if you want to. In terms of the axis, the hypothalamus releases corticotropin releasing hormone, which acts on the anterior pituitary to cause it to um, secrete adrenocorticotropic hormone, um, which acts on the adrenal glands and causes them to make cortisol is one of the hormones that they make. Uh, then that cortisol comes back around um, and acts as a negative feedback loop for the hypothalamus to stop and the anterior pituitary to stop them from making that an exponential process. And the overall effect of cortisol is increased glucose metabolism. So it's one of the things that um, opposes insulin. So other things that the adrenal gland produces, um, when it comes to this, this is one of the things that I turn back to my anatomy to think for as to why the signs and symptoms are happening the way they are. So the adrenal gland itself is sit here um, and it's split into the cortex and the medulla. For our purposes, um, in terms of endocrine today, the medulla makes catecholamines such as adrenaline. We're not gonna think about that too much, but the cortex is subdivided into the glomerulosa, fasciculata and reticularis. Um, so the glomerulosa does mineral corticoids, such as aldosterone, and they're to do with sodium and potassium balance. The fasciculata does glucocorticoids, such as cortisol, and that's kind of all to do with your metabolism. And the reticularis, so the deepest layer, does um, androgens, so sex hormones that will then undergo peripheral conversion into testosterone and the such like. Um, and the mnemonic that I'm sure people will remember from clinical years is salt, sugar, sex. The deeper it goes, the sweeter it gets. Um, that's, again, really important to help you think of what these patients are going to be experiencing in the future. So I like to come back to first principles on that. So in terms of our case, we've got Miss G and she's 22 years old. Who's, so she's young. She presents into the A&E department with, uh, with shock. Um, she's not passing any urine. She's got low blood pressure and a high heart rate from her collateral history, which we never like, because it means that she's kind of unresponsive, so that's a bad sign. Um, she has been unwell with a chest infection that's required antibiotics for the past few days. When we examine her, we notice that she is leaned and appears tanned. So what we're talking about here is one of the presentations of adrenal insufficiency. So the signs and symptoms of this are related to kind of, when you think about um, the fact that people don't have the metabolism or salt balance. So they're going to have tanned skin. And the reason that is, is because you have um, in, in one particular condition, it's because you have an increase in ACTH and that activates melanocytes. Um, they're going to find it hard to gain weight because they've got the opposite of insulin. Uh, sorry. No. Um, they've got a low appetite. They're going to have fatigue, muscle weakness, um, low mood, uh, abdominal syndromes, and they're going to be syncopal. Um, when you look at them and you look for signs, they're going to kind of be lean. Um, and again, because of that ACGH reacting on melanocytes, you're going to have hyperpigmentation of the buccal mucosa, so inside the mouth, and palmar creases. 
um, because they've not got that aldosterone to kind of help regulate their salts and blood pressure, they're going to have postural hypotension um, and tachycardia, and then it can also be associated with vitiligo. So here's some pictures. So this one here shows kind of the increased tanned appearance with um, kind of darker patches as well. Um, here's the palmar creases with hyperpigmentation and of the buccal mucosa. And this is what vitiligo like, is like. It's kind of the hypopigmentation of skin. Um, when we think of causes, the primary causes of the gland is what we call Addison's, Addison's disease. So if there's a problem with the gland, it's Addison's disease. Um, if it's a problem somewhere else, so if it's a problem with the pituitary, you can't call it Addison's disease, it's only of the gland. Um, and in the UK, the commonest cause of that is autoimmunity. Um, but worldwide, it's tuberculosis. And you can also get it from metastasis or lymphoma or opportunic inf infections in um, HIV. Um, the second, a really common second cause is we use a lot of um, steroids here. So iatrogenic giving of pharmacological steroids will suppress the pituitary adrenal access, um, axis. Sorry. But you won't necessarily notice that um, until the patient comes off their steroids abruptly. Um, so they can kind of tick along happily. Um, and that's why patients need to wear things like steroid badges, because um, to the untrained eye, they won't have had any symptoms. Um, and if you don't know that they're on steroids, then you can't necessarily help them in the ways that they need. In terms of investigations, I'll go through the kind of um, axis bit in a second. But um, there's a set of bloods that I specifically look for in kind of Addison's disease um, if it comes up in my single best answers. And that is a low sodium and a high potassium due to low mineralocorticoid. Um, so normally mineralocorticoids will do the opposite of that. So if you don't have them, you kind of have the opposite blood result. Um, and a low glucose due to low cortisol. So that is, again, if I ever see low sodium, high potassium, low glucose, written on an exam paper, I'm thinking this is an adrenal problem, and even beyond the um, kind of exam scenario in a patient that presents into an A&E scenario, um, this is what you're thinking. So low sodium, high potassium, low glucose. Um, then when thinking about the blood test for the axis itself, um, you can check for cortisol, ACTH, aldosterone, and renin. Um, aldosterone is part of the RAS system for maintaining blood pressure, so um, that's why you check for that as well. So primary is of the, of the gland itself, so of the adrenals. So they're not, gonna, they're not working quite so well. They're not going to be able to make this cortisol, um, which means there's not going to be any negative feedback. So there'll be low cortisol, high ACTH. Um, or des they're also not going to be able to make their aldosterone. That's going to make it low. Um, and then because of that, the feedback for renin will make it high. Um, in terms of secondary, you're going to have a low cortisol, and a low ACTH because this is the problem here. So if there's a low this, then you're not going to get stimulation, you're going to get low this. But there, your aldosterone and renin are normal. Um, and then for these patients as well, like we said, it's autoimmune condition kind of 80% of the time in the UK. So um, you're going to check for 21 hydroxylase adrenal antibodies. Um, and this is for a sign of autoimmune disease. Um, if these are negative, you want to check for other causes. So especially if where the history indica indicates it, so TB or malignancy. And when you follow them up, you want to check that blood pressure is okay, that they haven't got those electrolyte -like disturbances in this box here, and that they don't have other autoimmune diseases like pernicious anemia, which is a lack of intrinsic factor leading to B12 deficiency. Um, so the kind of hallmark test for Addison's disease is the synectin test or short ACTH stimulation test. Um, and what you do is perform this in the morning because the adrenals are kind of sprightly in the morning and this is when they want to get up and go. So they're going to work the best then if they haven't work at all. Um, so you give synactin, which is a synthetic ACTH. Um, and what, so that, what, what that should do in a patient that doesn't have anything wrong with them, giving that ACTH will stimulate your adrenals to make cortisol. Um, so what you're measuring is cortisol at 0, 30 and 60 minutes. Um, again, if the adrenals are functioning, you'll get a rise in that cortisol. And that should be at least two times. Um, if there's a less than two times baseline raise, then that's Addison's disease. Treatment, you replace the steroids um, and you titrate them to the symptoms of the patient and the electrolytes. Uh, Fluidocortisone for aldosterone and hydrocortisone for cortisol. Um, in terms of for um, your patients and kind of 
like higher doctor levels um, don't give the steroids late in the day they cause the patient to have sleep disturbance and doesn't make people very happy um, and then also it's important to comment on sick day rules for these patients so when they're poorly they need so things like surgery or infections they need to increase their dose and frequency um, they need to monitor their blood sugar because it will, they're at risk of hypoglycemia so they need to eat lots of carbohydrates also um, and if they've got diarrhea or vomiting, you might need to give them intramuscular steroids or they might need to come in for intravenous steroids because you have to remember these patients aren't making their own. Um, and part of the stress response is you need high cortisol um, to kind of fight your infection. So that's why these patients need more. And then finally, they, uh, for the Addison's disease, and there's just a little bit more about um, kind of excess um, adrenal hormones in a moment. But Addisonian crisis is kind of your severe... Um, problem with Addison's disease um, and you think about it if patients have got an intercurrent illness on top of their Addison's disease or if they're on long-term steroids um, and they've not been taking their tablets well um, they'll present as shocked so high heart rate low blood pressure not a very high urine output and they'll be confused uh, again this doesn't kind of just happen on its own you need infection or trauma or surgery or them to be not taking their tablets for this to happen so you give the treatment urgently, this is an emergency, you need to call endocrine um, urgently and you need to look for that kind of low sodium, high potassium, low glucose. Um, so you need to give them their hydrocortisone and glucose to stop them from being hypoglycemic and collect their, collect their electrolytes. So if they're hyperkalemic, you might need to do that kind of protocol. Um, if it's an adrenal disease, you want to consider giving um, a mineralocorticoid replacement too. Um, again, treat the underlying cause and call endocrine. So back onto our case, Mrs. G is a 22 year old female who presents to the A&E department shocked, um, low urine output, low blood pressure, tachycardia. Um, she's, got, she's been unwell for the last few days and she's got chest infection. Um, she's lean and appears tanned. So what we're asking here is how, what do you expect her blood results to look like? So I'm not gonna read those out because they're a bit um, hard to read out, but if I'll release the poll now and then you can have a look to see what's going on. If there's any questions about Addison's disease, I'll ask them, answer them now before quickly moving on to um, the final scenario, which is excess adrenal hormones. Okay, so I'll leave that there. Um, I think and there's been enough time, so hopefully you'll be able to go back and look at these if you haven't answered it already. So the correct answer here is low sodium, high potassium and low glucose. Um, like I said about six times, bit of a spoiler. Um, again, really important to know, be able to spot, because um, this can also be your first presentation of um, Addison's disease. So if you see these blood, uh, blood results, you might want to check them out and call the endocrinologist. Um, all the other ones are a slight variation or slightly um, different. They might have a high lactate because they're infectious, but that's not the hallmark bloods that you'd expect to see kind of coming up on your exam papers. Okay, um, just see, a, I think a question just popped up. Oh, no, that was just the becoming a doctor team. So I'm now going to move on to our final section. That was the answer. Um, so case four, Miss S, Mrs. S, oh, sorry, poll results came back up. That should be it now. Uh, Mrs. S is a 54 year old female who comes to the GP and she's noticed some changes in her, to her body since taking high dose steroids for polymyalgia rheumatica for the past three months. So for anyone that doesn't know, polymyalgia rheumatica is a um, rheumatoid condition that causes um, pelvic and shoulder girdle pain. Um, and the treatment for it is really high dose steroids. So what we're talking about here, as kind of alluded to before, is Cushing syndrome. And what I mean by Cushing syndrome is a chronic glucocorticoid excess, so that's cortisol, uh, leading to a loss of the negative feedback of the HPA axis. So in terms of signs and symptoms, these are kind of the ones that you kind of counsel your patient for. Um, when it comes to putting them on steroids. So they might notice that they've put on weight, they have kind of mood swings, anywhere from low mood to um, almost psychosis, steroid-induced psychosis. Um, they're gonna have hirsutism, which is um, 
hair growth where it shouldn't be that's non-familial so for example um, you might have women with sort of chest hair or chin hair um, or kind of breast hair as well um, they might have patients might complain of erectile dysfunction irregular periods or virilization in females so that just means clitoromegaly sorry um, they might have acne um, again as a sign of increased kind of testosterone um, and they, they're more prone to Achilles tendon rupture for some reason that I'm not particularly sure of why. Um, in terms of signs, this is something that can come up in your OSCEs. Um, I'd get really good at knowing kind of these signs so you can call them out in a rhythmic order if this patient were to come in because there's lots of patients on steroids out there, there's lots of Cushingoid patients so it's quite an easy one to find, I think. Um, in terms of signs, there's central adiposity. So that's kind of the, the weight gain is on the tummy. Um, the next two phrases are a bit mean spirited. So moon face and buffalo hump. Um, mean, moon face just means kind of big round face and buffalo hump is an intrascapular fat pad. Do be careful what you say in front of patients um, and whether or not you want to use those terms at all. But that's kind of the classical descriptive words that are used. Um, they're gonna have thin skin, uh, bruising, purple striae, so stretch marks, particularly in the abdominal area. They're going to have thin bones, and they're going to have a high blood pressure, um, raised glucose due to the fact that they've got loads of cortisol kind of opposing that insulin, and they're going to be slightly immunosuppressed with a lot of infections. So this is a classical picture of kind of, well, a diagram, it's not a picture of a person, um, what you kind of expect to see in um, a patient that's got, that is Cushingoid. So just have a look back at that at your own time. When we think about the causes, we split them into ACTH dependent and ACTH independent. So ACTH dependent causes um, is Cushing's disease is the number one. So you might have mentioned before that I was saying this patient here has Cushing's syndrome. So that's just kind of the cluster of signs and symptoms. But when you say Cushing's disease, when you say that, what you mean is an ACTH security secreting pituitary microadenoma. Um, so if there's any other cause for the Cushing syndrome, then it's not Cushing's disease. It has to be that um, kind of basophilic pituitary microadenoma that's secreting ACTH. And what happens there is the glands, the adrenal glands bilaterally um, get hyperplasia um, and secrete loads of their hormones. In terms of um, another reason that you might have an ACH dependent cause for being Cushingoid, um, you get some weird and wonderful cancers that can produce ACTH ectopically. Um, one of them is the small cell lung cancer. Small cell lung cancer can do all sorts of weird and wonderful things and present in all sorts of weird and wonderful ways. And one of these is as Cushingoid syndrome. Um, and then it can also happen in carcinoid, tum carcinoid tumors also. When we're thinking about ACTH independent causes, those are the steroids that patients are given by practitioners and also if there's an adrenal malignancy, which is fairly rare. So to investigate them, first of all, you have to check that it's not just kind of, you have to check that there is a problem with their cortisol. Um, you can't just assume that patients have a problem. So you just do a basic 9 a.m. cortisol. Cortisol is a circadian rhythm, circadian rhythm, sorry. So it's high in the morning. So you always typically measure it at nine o'clock or as close to nine o'clock or at the same time for each patient each day. Um, and that will be raised and then that triggers you to move on to the next set of testing. So these tests are a little bit confusing, so um, do bear with me, but also um, have a look back at them at your own leisure and maybe use some other resources to check them for yourselves as well. So once we know that the plasma cortisol is raised, um, you then need to do something called an overnight dexamethasone suppression test. So kind of what it says in the tin really. Um, dexamethasone is a um, potent steroid that has high glucocorticoid activity. So you give one milligram to this at patients at midnight and you measure their morning cortisol. So what you'd expect to happen um, is if you're, giving, if you're giving a high glucocorticoid, you get that negative feedback back onto the anterior pituitary. So you get a decrease in the ACTH and then a decrease in that patient's cortisol because you're not measuring the dexamethasone in their body, you're measuring the cortisol they're making. So you'd expect a suppression of the um, cortisol in that patient. So if that patient doesn't then get any suppression of their cortisol, that is then that Cushing syndrome, so that cluster due to excess glucocorticoid. 
then if the patient have a positive overnight dexamethasone, dexamethasone suppression test, you're then going to move on and do the next testing, which is the high dose dexamethasone suppression test. And the reason you do an extra one of these is because at the moment, we don't know at all why this patient has these problems. You just know that they have them. So this is now going to help you kind of localize where the pathology is. So you give them a whacking great dose of dexamethasone, um, eight milligrams at night time, and then you get them back in the morning um, to check for their cortisol. So if the ACTH dependent cause, so Cushing's disease, that pituitary microadenoma, um, at high levels of dexamethasone, that, that microadenoma still shows a response to negative feedback. So it doesn't at low levels, but when you give that whacking dose of eight milligrams, you are gonna get some negative feedback. Um, so you are going to get a suppression of both your cortisol and your ACTH. When it comes to ACTH independent causes in an adrenal adenoma, um, cortisol is not going to get suppressed by the test because um, you're just secreting it anyway, um, because you've got, some, you've got some sort of lump in your adrenal gland that's making all this hormone for you. But your ACTH will get suppressed because it's not, um, it's not invincible to kind of the dexamethasone. And then in an ectopic cause, such as the small cell lung cancer, um, neither your ACTH or cortisol will be suppressed as the process is completely independent and driven by, not driven by anything to do with your pituitary or hypothalamus or the HPA axis. So that is a bit confusing. So what I've put here is kind of like a little sum summary of what you'd expect to see in the eight milligram dexamethasone suppression test. Um, like I said, you start with just checking it's high, then you go on to see um, is it actually high? Um, and then if, when I give them dexamethasone, and then you go on to try and localise, and this is the results of the localised here. So feel free to go back and have a look at that. How do you treat them? So you treat, again, in medicine, a great phrase, treat the underlying cause. Um, so if it's because you've given them too many steroids, um, get the kind of high level consultant that's looking after them to see whether or not you can reduce those steroids, um, do a cost benefit analysis on those drugs. If they're Cushing disease, so they've got that pituitary microadenoma, can't stress enough that Cushing disease is a pituitary microadenoma, um, then you're going to do a transphenoidal, so through the nose, removal of the, of the um, lump in the pituitary. In terms of an adrenal tumour, you're going to surgically remove it. Um, and in terms of those small cell lung cancers, you're going to surgically remove it. But if the patient can't have it removed, because obviously um, there's only a certain amount of lung that can be taken out um, and often presents late, so what you can do is you can remove both of the adrenal glands and replace the patient's steroid for the rest of their life if you think that is, if the consultant thinks that's worthy, or the MDT, sorry, thinks that's worthy. So final question. Um, Mrs. S is a 54-year-old, so that should be female, who comes to the GP as she has noticed some changes to her body since taking high-dose steroids for polymyalgia rheumatica over the past three months. Which one, of the, which one of the below signs would you not expect to see? So important point is here is you not expect to see. That's why I always take a highlighter to my exams because I never read the question properly. Um, so I always try and answer it the other way around. So this is a negative question here. Um, and the answers are abdominal striae, bruising, central adiposity, postural hypertension or hirsutism. So that poll should be up now. Give you another couple seconds and I'll end that. And then I'll get to any questions that are remaining. Perfect, so I'll end that now because most people have voted. So, most people got it right. Yeah, postural hypotension. So in an excess of adrenal hormones, you're gonna have an excess mineralocorticoid, corticoid, so you're gonna have high blood pressure. Postural hypotension is a sign of um, um, a decree, uh, sorry, an insufficiency of adrenal hormones. So that's why that's the right answer. In terms of hirsutism, that is um, that is something that we'd see because you have an excess of the kind of androgens produced by the um, reticularis of the adrenal cortex. Um, so you would expect to see that, um, and that's kind of that male pattern hair growth that's not familiar. Okay, so just a quick 
there you go, postural hypotension. So in summary, we've just remembered that primary endocrine disease is of the gland, secondary is of the pituitary or hypothalamus. Can't stress that enough. It's much easier to go back, I think, from first principles when you're interpreting, interpreting blood results. So I like to always think of my axis when I'm trying to um, kind of interpret what's going on. Um, if then in terms of the definitive management of hyperthyroidism is going to be a surgery. Hypothyroidism, you just re replace the missing hormone. Um, Addisonian crisis is easy to miss, but it's dangerous. It's not easy to understand, but it's easy to miss and it is dangerous. So remember you're thinking about those bloods that we talked about, low sodium, high potassium, low glucose. Um, and then Cushing syndrome is the overarching term for a cl cluster of symptoms, I should say. Cushing disease is specific to a pituitary microadenoma. Often you'll find that people are a little bit pernickety about terminology. So if you really kind of hit the nail on the head with that, um, it puts you in a good stance when you're answering questions in front of an examiner. So I think that's it for me. Um, I'm going to leave it on the feedback sign. And um, if you could just give me some feedback, that would be great. I will answer any questions now. Um, so do stick around if you want to, but if not, thanks for listening. Um, Okay, sorry. Okay, so someone's asked what about low dose suppression testing? Um, I'm not sure what, what, what about it. Um, that, that, if we think about that, that was going back to the um, where you give a low dose to just check that the patients are crushing oid. Um, is there any medical management for Cushing's disease? Um, so not as such as I'm aware, but when it comes to all of these patients, they've got a higher risk of cardiovascular mortality for being on their steroids. So your classical things are please don't smoke, um, please make sure you do some exercise and maintain a healthy diet as well as controlling those other cardiovascular risk factors are really important in these patients. Um, and also um, try and kind of minimise any pain that they might have so you can reduce the, um, the, reduce the steroids. Um, do we give Lugol iodine in thyroid storm? That is not something I've particularly heard of, um, so I'm not sure. Um, in terms of thyroid storm, what we want to do is we stop that peripheral conversion, so we're giving that steroid, um, stop the peripheral conversion, and we're going to keep them kind of homeostatically well um, with fluid balance and things like that, and then we're going to... Um, Sorry, I just lost my train of thought there. Um, and then we're going to treat their symptoms with either a non-selective beta blocker or digoxin if you're not winning. Um, it might be something that's in other guidelines, but in my trust guidelines, I'm, I'm not particularly sure that I've heard of something like that before. Um, often treatments are changing, so I'm not particularly sure. Um, and just on to the Q&A questions quickly. Does medical treatment, e.g. carbimazole, get rid of the goiter too? Um, I'm just going to answer that now. Um, so that is a good question and um i would i don't think it necessarily does because it depends on what the cause of the goiter is obviously um if it's because there's infiltrates um causing that swelling of the neck you might not necessarily get rid of those cells until you kind of treat the autoimmunity um it's just treating the problem uh, of the excess thyroid hormone rather than the cause of the disease itself and that's why often patients will come with a cosmetic issue regarding despite the fact that they've been on medical treatment Okay. Um, what's the indication for USG in goiter? Um, I'm not sure what USG means, so I, I do apologise. If you want to type what that means, then that, that's fine. Sorry, <laughs> I'm just in, sure, I'm not sure what that means. Um, why do you need to prevent TSH suppression with levothyroxine? Um, and why is TSH needed of giving levothyroxine anyway? Um, I think that's just to maintain kind of a homeostatic balance. Um, apologies if you want kind of a more accurate answer, I'm not particularly sure. Um, I think that there's obviously some sort of consequence for um, suppressing the TSH. So if symptoms persist like, despite adherence to maximum dose treatment, what is the next step after thyroxine? T3. So I think the, the dose of thyroxine can go 
really high. Um, so you, you just titrate, titrate up. T3 is only indicated in those acute scenarios such as myxedema coma, so the really severe hypothyroidism um, in which patients are needed. Um, obviously, patients are seen on an individual basis, and I'm not sure what happens in the really high-end endocrinology clinics but in terms of um, in terms of sorry, in terms of um, most patients, thyroxine will levothyroxine will accommodate what they need completely. Okay, and ultrasound is ultrasound. Uh, USG is ultrasound. No worries. Sorry about that. Um, so the indications in goiter are if it's nodular, so if patient's got a lumpy, bumpy neck, because um, you want to make sure that, that it is not a malignancy. Um, and also if you have kind of peripheral signs of um, like kind of any neck lump, if there's any question about it, we'll always have an ultrasound because there's lots of different differentials that you should look up for a neck lump. Um, so typically most patients with a goiter will go and have the neck ultrasounded um, as the first line imaging investigation. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, that's it from me, everybody. So thank you very much for listening to me and I hope you have a nice evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>